Teresa Felt. Also, uh, in the sermon I preached this morning, there was one mistake. There is no such verse as Titus chapter 1, verse 20. I actually had four or five people tell me that. Thank you, actually. You're paying attention. Uh, that's wonderful. And so it's actually Titus chapter 1, verse 2. I have corrected sermon outlines actually on the table out there for those of you that are OCD that can't stand anything off, which is me. And so they're out there if you want copies of them. My sermon tonight is a continuation of the study of the church. Whether you realize it or not, you're in the middle of a series. Yes, I like series. I gave you a sermon a few weeks ago on the kingdom of Jesus the Christ. I gave you a sermon last week on how he shall build the temple of the Lord. And my sermon here this evening, a continuation of this study of the church, and in particular, we're studying the body of Jesus Christ. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 to 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Okay, I'm going to make sure this is on. All right, there's two or three things I want to get from this particular text here. First of all, I want you to realize and see here how the church, which is called his body, and that Jesus is the head of the body, and Jesus is the head of the church. Now, right now, as I'm sitting up here and I'm talking and I'm moving around, all these words and all these actions are being controlled by my head. There is nothing that is not being controlled by my head. You remove my head from my body, my body's dead and does nothing. And so this is trying to explain to us the role that Jesus has in the church. He's not a director of part of it. He's totally directing it in every single function. We do nothing without the guidance and direction of Jesus the Christ. And also we learn from this that the church is the body. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, uh, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So again, all I want you to see is what I've got for you in yellow tent here. I've already pointed out he's the head of the body, but I want you to see what the body is. The church. The body is the church. They are one and the same. You find again Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, which is, and he is the savior of the body. We've already learned he's the head of the church, but here again he uses the term church and he goes straight from that to the body. So all I'm wanting you to see right now, one simple point, the church and the body are the same thing. Now that being said, let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So when he says there is one body, and we've learned earlier from three verses, the body is the church, then the conclusion I come to is there's one church. Now sometimes when people hear us teaching this, they think, well, you folks are just arrogant. You think you're the only ones going to heaven. And then let me ask you this question. Is anyone other than the one body going to heaven? <laughs> now, when you see, when I ask that question that way, everybody goes, well, no, only the one body's going to heaven. You got it. Years ago, when we did missionary work in Czechoslovakia, my translator, he said, what are you? And I said, I'm a Christian. And he said, I know that. What are you? And I said, I'm a member of the body of Christ. And he said, I know that. Well, what are you? Yes, I did it again. I'm a Christian. And he was getting angry by this time. What are you? And I said, I understand your question. You don't understand my answer. Because when I give you the answer that you want, you're not going to understand what I'm saying. I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Oh, I got you now. You're those people. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. I'm a member of the one body. I'm a member of the one church. I'm a citizen of the one kingdom. I'm a living stone in the one temple. Got it? One temple, one kingdom, 
one body, one church. They're all saying the same thing. I believe there's only one body. Thus, there's only one church. And we learn in the text here, there's one baptism. Now then, again, sometimes folks will get really angry at us because uh, we talk a lot about baptism. You know why? Well, the Bible talks about it. If the Bible didn't say there was one baptism, uh, I, I may not say that, but the Bible says it. There's one baptism, and there's one body. Now that we've nailed that down, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. But the Jews are Greeks, the slaves are free, and have all been, to make, made, to, been made to drink into one spirit. All right, there's one baptism. Remember that earlier? There's one body. And you're baptized into the one body. That's why we stress baptism. Because this is the way you are added to the church is by obeying the gospel. This is the way you become a living stone in the house of God. This is the way you become a citizen in the kingdom as by being born of the water and the spirit. That's the way you enter to it, using the keys of the kingdom. And this is the way you get into the body. They're all saying the same thing different ways. But what they're all saying the same thing is baptism plays a crucial role into your being a member of the one body. And so, if that offends people, okay, I'm going to go with what it says. There's one body, there's one baptism, and whenever an individual is baptized, they're baptized into the one body. And so the question is this, are you a member of the one body? Are you a member of the one church? Are you a citizen of the one kingdom? Are you a living stone in the one house of God? You see how that works? They're all saying the same thing, aren't they? And so when I tell someone I'm a member of the body of Christ, all I'm saying is I've obeyed the gospel and I'm a member of the one body. When I'm saying that I'm a member of the one church, I'm saying the exact same thing a different way. Not different things, same thing. Now, then, one of the wonderful things we learn as we study about the one body is that, yes, Jesus is the head, but the body is made up of many different members. From 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 20, But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. So again, one body, many members. 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So... My body, physical body up here, is not just one hand, one eye, one ear. No, it's a combination of many different functioning parts of the body. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, this time. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And then finally, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30. And we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So the body is made up of many members. And so now as we start studying these members, we're going to learn that they have different functions. In Romans chapter 12, 14, or 4 through 5 it is. Chapter 12, verse 4 through 5. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members don't have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And so here, just a very simple observation. My body is made up of many different members, and the different members have different functions. You don't all have the same function. First Corinthians chapter 12, now verse 18. But now God has set the members, each of them, in the body just as he pleases. Ephesians 4, 16. For from the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies or core in the effective working by which, look at this, every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. There's several things there. He talks about every part does its share. Now, where we're going to go with this part of the sermon is I want every single one of you to recognize this. 
You are a member in the body of Christ if you have obeyed the gospel. And as a member of the body of Christ, you have to find out what your function is, what it is you are able to do. Sometimes you may not realize what your abilities are until you start exploring exactly what it is you can do. To be honest with you folks, I didn't know I could preach until they asked me to. I was as surprised as anybody else. When I found out I could do this, and I was extremely surprised when I found out how fulfilling it is. Find out what you can do. Every one of you have a function in this congregation, in the body of Christ even as a whole. You need to find out what it is because it is through all the members of the body of Christ working together that the body grows and is built up and edified and strengthened. When all of us are working together. This is going back a long way, Gary, but I'm going to share with them a conversation I had with you. And uh, this is the way it went. When I sat down with Gary and the men who used to be the deacons here, and some of them still are, when I was first being asked to consider moving here, I sat down with you and I said this with you. I will not work for you. I will work with you. And you will not work with me. I will not come. And you all said, we'll work with you. Yes, and you are. And that is why the congregation grows. If it was just me, just the preacher, doing everything, well, we may move forward a little bit, but it's going to be really tough. I try to explain it to people like this. I got a lawnmower this year, so I get to mow the yard again. Imagine me out there with the lawnmower, and I'm only using one leg and one arm. Can I mow the yard with one leg and one arm? Yeah, but it's going to look crazy. And it's going to look really bad, and it's going to take a long time, and I'll probably die of a heart attack by doing it. Uh, it'd be a whole lot better if I got two legs and two arms. And that's uh, even better when my wife gets in there and helps me. <laughs> because you see, now we got more than one. And when there's more than one, you've got people working together and you can get the job done a whole lot quicker, a lot easier. There's many members. Find out what your function is and let's all just acknowledge this is what I can do and then just do it. In Ephesians chapter 4, he goes on further and explains this, verses 11 through 13. And he himself gave some to be apostles and prophets. So let's stop right there. The apostles and prophets were temporary in the body of Christ. The apostles' primary function was to bear witness to what they had seen pertaining to Jesus Christ, that they had seen the risen Christ, and they were giving witness and testimony to that everywhere they went because that was confirming that he was the Christ, the Son of God. The apostles were the primary individuals through whom the Holy Spirit gave us the new covenant in written revelation. But prophets also were the ones speaking the word of God to the local congregations before they even had the written revelation. And so the function of the apostles and prophets was to get the will of God and the word of God to the brethren, to the congregation. Once the word of God has been given and it's complete, the function of the apostles and prophets no longer is needed and they're gone. So now we don't have apostles and prophets. But at the time of the writing of Ephesians, you did. After that, he says, some evangelist. That's what I am. I'm an evangelist. I'm a preacher. I'm a minister. All of those are describing the same work. Some pastors. Also, I'm that. A pastor is a shepherd. It's also an elder. It's also a bishop. All of those are describing the same work. And teachers. We got a bunch of you, male and female. You're teachers. And so, notice what he says about this. For the equipping of the saints. The idea is equipping, giving you everything you need. The apostles and prophets, through them the Holy Spirit gave us the word. The responsibility of the evangelist is to preach the word. The responsibility of the elders is to feed the word to the flock. The responsibility of the teachers is to teach the word. You see how it works? Apostles and prophets receive the word. Evangelists, pastors, and teachers teach the word. And we're all giving the word to the brethren here. It builds it up. It's for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, there it is again, 
the building up and strengthening of the body of Christ. I have total confidence in the power of the Word of God to accomplish exactly what God wants it to. If we will give you a good, balanced diet of the Word of God, my responsibility is to tell you what it says to look into it and to put together the sermons that fit where you are in your lives, your spiritual needs, whatever they are, and then deliver them to you and deliver them to you. And again, the elders' primary job is to feed the flock of God that is among us. And those of you that are teachers, teaching whatever age it is, the Word of God. And when we're working together, the congregation is built up. He's given us everything we need, all the equipment, Right here in us. The Bible in us. Ephesians continuing chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow. What kind of growth we're talking about here. Growing and growing and growing. The job is to help every individual here to continue to grow in your relationship with God, to grow in your faith, to grow in the knowledge of the will of God, to grow in your love for God, to continue to grow and grow and grow and grow with the ultimate goal to get you across the finish line in Christ. While you're here on this side, to grow in your relationship with God, to grow as a Christian, to grow stronger. Now listen real close to this. As the individual members of a congregation grow stronger, the congregation as a whole grows stronger. That's the way it works. We're trying to build everyone up, strengthen everyone. And again, that's done through the Word. But let's go a step further. Now let's go to Romans chapter 12. Because we're going to be seeing some other things here in Romans 12. Romans 12, 6 through 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. You remember early back in Ephesians, the apostles and prophets? Here's prophecy here again. What comes after that? Or ministry. You remember back in Ephesians, after you got through with the prophets and the apostles and prophets, the very next ones was the evangelists. Here they are again. Ministers. Let us use it in our ministering. Or he who teaches in teaching. Now we've got somebody else here. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads, I believe again, is talking about the pastors, the elders, with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now let's just stop right there. Some of you aren't evangelists. Okay. Some of you aren't elders. Okay. Some of you aren't even teachers. Okay. So you ain't got anything to do, right? <laughs> no, that's not right. You got something to do. You may be someone who's really good at exhortation. Do you realize that's a very important work in the kingdom? I'm going to tell you something about everybody here. We get discouraged sometimes. We get burnt out sometimes. We may even sink into depression sometimes. We go through difficult times sometimes. When we sense that about one another, you know what an exhort exhorter does? They look at one another and they say, you see where this person is? What can we do to help them? What can we say to encourage them? Your ability may just be your ability to send a card to someone. Yeah. I was visiting one of the brethren here this past week. And he said to me, let me show you something. Look at these cards. This sister in Christ sends me a card every week. You have no idea how much this means to me. How important it is to me. This is so special to me. I mean something to y'all. That's an important work, exhortation. Because people are being beat down and discouraged and going through difficult times. Calling one another, texting one another, praying for one another, going and visiting one another. The beauty of this congregation is that we actually care about each other. 
And we're members working together, teaching together, encouraging, exhorting together. And even whenever we see a need, we give. When y'all hear about people overseas and you realize how difficult it is for them, you say, what can we do? What can we give? That's one of the works of the kingdom. He who gives with liberality. That's right there in the list with the teachers and the prophets and the evangelists and the elders. It's right in there with them. You have the ability to give. You may not be able to teach, but God is blessing you financially and you're using those finances to help a lot of others out there. You see how that's working? Figure out what you can do. Do you think the teaching of little kids is important? You better believe it is. It's crucially important. You are preparing the soil so that whenever they reach the age of understanding, they readily, quickly receive that seed into their hearts and then they have their own faith and they live by faith. Every individual who's a member of this congregation that was baptized here, you are the result of the congregation's work, not just the preacher. A lot of times I come in and do the cleanup work. Because <laughs> you've already studied with them. Somebody's already worked with them. And they say, Wayne, can you come study with them? I have two Bible studies. They obey the gospel. And everybody says, great work, Wayne. I just had two studies with them. One study with them. You're working with them. I'm just coming in and helping along the way. Teamwork. You see how it's working? We're growing together, the body, finding out what your function is and then doing it to the best of your ability. First Corinthians says in chapter 12, 21 through 22, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. <laughs> no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Okay, let's get back to your physical body. Your yeah, little toe, it really doesn't do a whole lot, so you don't mind me chopping it off, do you? <laughs> back off, guy. Leave my toe alone. Is there any part of your body that you wouldn't just say, yeah, you can take it, I don't need it? What? No. I need them all, so back off. Every member of this congregation is important. If you think you're not important, you're wrong. There's no such thing as an unimportant member of the body of Christ. Sometimes you may think, well, I've done most of my work in my life. I'm older. I can't do very much. You're here. You've come physically, and we know it's not easy for you to even get here. And we are being encouraged by your presence, period. Just by you having the strength of character to show to those of us that are younger, whose bodies are strong, it is important to come together with God, people, and worship, even when your body doesn't function right anymore. So yeah, you're doing something. You're encouraging us just by your presence. There's no such thing as an unimportant member. There's no such thing as a member that doesn't have a function. And if you're functioning, you think, well, I'm not doing very much with this. <laughs> That's not true. Especially when you get all the members working together. Let's close out with 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Again, he's describing here the body. Every now and then, I get a toe that hurts because of one of my toenails is grown and sticking in there, and it hurts when I walk. So I don't go, well, get better down there. Good luck. Uh, no, it's a long way down there, folks. And I got to get that toe, and I got to grab it with one of my hands, and I got to twist it. And I got to use my eyes to get in there and see where it is. And I got to use my clippers and I'm focusing on it. All of my body is working together for one simple thing, to get that toenail out. That's a simple and stupid example probably, but makes the point. All of my body is working together to relieve the pain. That's the way the physical body works. That's the way the body of Christ works. That's why we're trying to grow in our love for one another. 
to where when a brother or sister is hurting emotionally or physically or spiritually, we are sensitive to their pain. And when we're conscious of their pain, we hurt with them and do the best we can collectively together to alleviate that pain as quick as possible or make the pain possible to deal with. Sometimes you can't make the pain go away. But they don't have to hurt alone. I told you all this the other day in the gospel meeting, and I'll tell you again. I am proud to be a member of the Airport Loop Church of Christ. I am proud to be part of you, working together with you. One of the things I am the most proud of is that you honestly love each other. That you will be there and rally around each other in your times of grief and pain and difficulty. When one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That's the goal. Are we there yet? Not really. We're going in the right direction, though. Now then, let's press on toward that goal of growing in our love for God, finding out what our function is, and then doing it to the very best of our ability. Someone may plant, someone else may water, but in the end, God gives the increase. The growth of a congregation is done when the members work together. And a congregation grows in another way and is edified and built up when we honestly love each other. But going back to what we learned earlier, there's only one body, folks. Only one. And the body is the church. And so when I say there's just one church, I'm not being narrow minded. And I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to explain to you that there's one church because there's only one body. They're the same thing. And that obeying the gospel is the way you'll get into it. There's one baptism, and you're baptized into the one body. So when you obey the gospel, something's happening to you. And Acts chapter 2, those that gladly received his word in verse 41 were baptized. Verse 47, the Lord is adding to the church daily those that are being saved. Right, let me ask you this question. Are only the saved going to be saved? Um, yes. Only the saved are going to be saved. All the church is, is the saved. That's all it is. All the body is, is the saved. All the kingdom is, is the saved. All the house of God is, and the temple is the saved. That's all it is. And the way you become saved is by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, baptism is a crucial part of that. It's not everything. It's part of it. Being born again, there's more than being born of the water. You've got to get the point of faith. You have to have faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, realizing he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. Be willing to openly confess that faith and then motivated by your faith, make the great commitment of repentance to follow God's word by faith in your life, to put off the old man and put on the new man. It's the biggest commitment of your life. When you make that commitment, we're willing to now take you and baptize you. One baptism into the one body. If you're in the one body already and there's sin between you and your God, you deal with it by taking it to your God, confessing it to him, and turning from it. We'll pray for you, we'll pray with you, and we'll do the best we can to encourage you and strengthen you. Again, the ultimate goal is this. We want every member of the body of Christ here to grow in their faith, to grow in their love for God, and ultimately to finish their race in Christ and be with God in heaven. But in that journey, we grow as members of the body of Christ, worshiping and working together. I thank you for your kind attention. If there's anybody here this evening who is subject to the gospel call in any way, let us know while we stand and sing the song that has been selected.